Welcome to Upside Down Mirror, one woman's true story of a twin flame journey, a reflection of true love, true hate, and everything between, where everything and nothing matters at the same time. shatter as mirrors of shadows cut through indestructible layers testing the sands of time hello everyone and welcome to upside down mirror episode 21 so now we are at the place where sean's mother is visiting for a few weeks she had just gotten sick as she was exposed to our divine portal of love and she was purging out the the shadow energies which essentially is clearing the DNA of my husband and my daughter because they all share DNA. Also during this time, Ryan and I had not stopped talking. We were still divine friends. We had actually had a ceremony planned together in Mount Shasta in a couple months. And I was excited to still do ceremony with them, even though my husband was stepping up to the plate, but you know, reflecting back, I know that my ultimate goal was to do ceremony with my husband. That's what I've always wanted to do. My divine partner out of the blue, Ryan calls me and tells me that he's fully and completely taking back his ex-wife, which would be great, but it was a very, very toxic environment full of dark energies, drugs, everything that he worked very hard to get out of. And I was extremely disappointed because I knew what was going to to happen. He had just gotten his mom to agree to give custody of his daughter back to him, but he wasn't allowed to get custody of his daughter back unless his mom saw that he was staying away from his ex. So he takes his ex back, completely loses the custody he would have got of his daughter, just, just everything he worked for, just he was losing it. And I said, I, I actually can't work with you in ceremony in this energy when you have these energies around you. So, you know, when things shift, let me know. And I wished him the best. And we didn't talk for a bit. You know, I was grief struck and wondering why he just decided to take something back that had made his life so toxic. And I stepped out of it because I was like, you know, who am I to be so, so judgmental? So then I went back into just really focusing on my life. And right now at hand, we had Sean's mother visiting. There was a lot of parenting stuff going on that I was noticing that probably had happened to Sean when he was a kid. And one of the things I noticed is, is that his mother, in order to bond with Willow, if Willow was in the living room playing with her toys, she would tell things to Willow that she was doing wrong. Like, don't make that much noise. That hurts my ears. Why are you doing all of that? Don't put all those toys out at one time. So she's basically parenting by telling her what not to do. Instead of getting down, playing with her, connecting. And right away, Sean walks into the room and he says, that's not how we're going to do this. Willow will put her toys away when she's done. She doesn't need to be bossed around and told what she's doing wrong. You can leave the room, mom, unless you're going to learn to play with her. And his mom looked at him very shocked, said fine, and she left the room. So I can see where the weight came on Willow, all that weight within the short amount of time when Willow was in England. And I was like, okay, we have to work on really releasing this from her because whatever happened without her mom and dad there with just her grandmother, she was holding 
a lot of stuff. So we started working on Willow with you don't have to hold other people's stuff. And we're still to this day trying to get her to release that weight that she put on during that time. And I tell her, you're not, don't hold my stuff. Don't hold daddy's stuff. Don't hold anybody's stuff. You know, because meanwhile, I'm really working on this, but I'm releasing the weight. I'm successfully releasing the weight. I'm almost to the point where I need to be to have my goal weight, just about 15 pounds left at this point. There were quite a few episodes with Sean's mom where things had to be reframed. I had to work on him energetically. We dug, we talked to her, things came out in the open, very mature conversations. So actually it ended up to be a very profound three weeks. It was different, but profound. And I saw clarity between going to England and being with Niall's friends and then being with his mother and seeing all of these different sides of him. I was like, okay, I'm beginning to understand this man that I married. And I understood what he meant when he said the day that we got married, he, he didn't really know what true love was. He thought he did. And that's what he had tried to say to me that one time when we were at that um, Halloween party and I got angry, but I was getting it now because he was hugging me and kissing me in ways that were so affectionate. You know, one time he went out to walk the dogs and he came back and he said, I saw a shooting star and immediately I wished that all of your wishes would come true, Rebecca. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. He would have never said that before. He would have thought that was too cliche. But he truly met it, and I was happy, and I felt that way about him. So I ended up doing the Mount Shasta ceremony with my husband and my other colleague, the teacher of Awake. We had a really great outcome. The energy that my husband displayed during that was amazing. We drove across country with Willow, our two dogs, and my husband together. It was very connective. You know, we talked about music and art and just, you know, talked about things that people don't normally talk about, just random subjects. We made a rule where we're not allowed to just fill space by talking about other people. Like we can't fill space by saying, has your mom gotten any better? What is your brother doing? Has this person done that? That's all gossipy. We had to fill space by talking about creative things. And that is a very good technique that you should do with your loved one when you're traveling or when there's silence in the conversation. Not that silence isn't good because it is, but fill that space with creative stuff. You can't say anything judgmental about anybody else or you can't talk about politics or what you saw on the news. You just have to bring up creative random subjects to fill your time. So by the time we got to Mount Shasta, it was five days because we took our time and we were ready actually to get settled. We had made the beautiful ayahuasca brew from the headwaters in, in Mount Shasta. That was a three day process. And the brew was absolutely perfect like usual. What I noticed is, is my husband was not in the same space at all because to be quite honest, I was done, like I told you, martyring. I was done trying to make people who they aren't. If my husband wanted to go and sit in a quarter looking on his phone, I would have probably divorced him, but I'm not going to yell at him, okay? I'm not going to try to change anybody, and I'd already decided that. So there was not one part of me that was trying to get my husband to do anything other than what he wanted to do. And he actually stood in his power. He got the music out. He was playing it. He was working on himself. He was working on other people. He told me that this, this was a connection, you know, that he had always desired, that he had done like LSD and psychedelics in his 20s. And so he was comparing it to that. And he said, no, this is so, so, so different. He goes, this is so different, Rebecca. I didn't realize all the magic and miracles that were happening in these beautiful ceremonies. There was something that happened 
that he even realized was complete portal magic and that there's something to these portals that we keep opening. So the Airbnb that we had rented for the ceremony, the woman who owned it locked the air conditions. And this was during a heat wave in Mount Shasta. It was like 100 degrees. Mind you, there's a bunch of 40, 50, maybe even early 60 year olds coming to this ceremony, up to four people sleeping in one room. We were like, oh no, this can't happen. I was calling students, paying them to buy portable air conditioners on their way if they happened to find them. You know, we got two small portable air conditioners that helped, but that was not going to be near enough for this heat wave. So Willow, Patricia, my colleague and I went outside and we were opening portals to the weather, asking for thunderstorms and rain and clouds. And then even Willow was even Willow said, yep, but we want stars too. And so she was giving us the stickers and she asked us whatever else we wanted. And at that point, uh, my colleague said, I want my own retreat center in Mount Shasta because she didn't want to deal with having to rent somebody's house. And so we were throwing all these stickers in the portal, just like I did at my house. And then Willow was doing things with her feet and her arms and teaching us how to activate the portals. And they put crowns in the portals too. I, don't, I didn't know why Willow did, but she kept putting crowns, like C-R-O-W-N-S in the, in the portals. And so the next day, the students get there. First, it's kind of hot. Immediately, it starts to thunderstorm, rain, and lightning. And that weather changed drastically. Not only that, there was a part of the ceremony where there was a, a girl who was stuck. And she looked at me and she said, Rebecca, I'm really stuck. And I don't know how to get out of it. And what I think is the universe always shows us where we need to be. If it's raining, don't say, oh my gosh, it's a rainy day. You're supposed to be in the rain. If it's snowing, walk out in that snow. The universe is telling us what we need with these seasons, with the weather. So I took her right out in the rain, thunder, lightning, everything. And within five minutes, she done it. She did a 360. We did some energy work. She was completely okay. Not only that, she went back and started healing people. And so before the end of the night, my husband is out there sitting in the rain, letting the rain just pour over him right beside my beautiful wolf dog. And I went out with him. And I held his hand and the, I mean, it's lightning and pouring rain. And even the guy next to us saw this. I said, I love you. And he said, I love you too. And we started speaking light language or star language to one another, which is something he just never would, would have done before. But we were fluently speaking it back and forth and kissing. And right as soon as our lips touched a kiss, a big, huge pang of thunder just went right across us. And even the guy next to us said, oh my God, you see that? And I said, yeah. That was so super magical. And right then I knew, I was like, we are connected. And that's when my husband realized, you know, he had been a Reiki master for some time, you know, before he even met me, actually. He could start using this. He could let this part of him out. To be honest with you, that I didn't even know was in there. I just assumed that healing part of him was something that I wanted to come out. But he actually wanted it to come out. He just does it in more of an artistic way than I do. So he ended up absolutely loving that ceremony to Mount Shasta, loving it. He did not want it to end and he could not wait until the next one. And I looked at my husband and I was like, okay, now this is what I've wanted. So we get back to our, our home at the lake and go back, our, go back to our everyday life. And a couple, few weeks later, I get a phone call from Ryan telling me, that he had made a really big mistake that he knows now that him and his wife are completely done. She stayed sober for three weeks and he said even her sober, he doesn't like, he thought before it was just the part of her that was on drugs, but he doesn't even, he's not even, even able to resonate or connect with her sober. And I could tell he was serious. I could tell that he was done. So. You know, he went through the process and ended up getting a divorce from his wife. 
that didn't change anything with him and I, but I felt really good that he was through that energy. I felt like, okay, he's, he's crossed a path. Now he is ready for someone that's going to treat him well. And then he even said to me, I'm going to use our connection, Rebecca, as a reference point so I can bring someone really healthy in for me. He actually ended up staying at his mother's where his daughter is. So his mother and daughter and him are building a relationship that had been damaged for quite some time. His daughter was learning to trust him. He was growing leaps and bounds. You know, I was extremely proud of him at this point. And I told him, I said, I am at this space in my diet where I literally need to lose seven pounds. And this is the seven pounds that I put on after I was raped. So this seven pounds is very stubborn because it's got that energy in it that is my body scared to let go of. So I told him, I was like, I'm going to plan a fasting trip where I'm going to come see you for three days and you can work on me energetically while I fast. For some reason, I feel like I need to be away from my house. And I told him, I was like, I'll pay you to do this like as my energy worker. And he was like, okay, just let me know when. And we had planned it for a few weeks out. But then that next morning, I heard so loud in my head, look at your husband's phone now. I was upstairs. He was downstairs sleeping on the couch and it was the morning. I picked up his phone, looked at it, and that same girl, Corinne, that he was not allowed to Facebook, had just responded to a message that he had left her. So what he was doing the entire time is just deleting their messages. And they told me, the guides told me, or my inner voice told me, or a higher guidance, go pick up the phone now. And I was absolutely devastated. I mean, it was something like, what did you dress for as Halloween? And she had answered what she dressed as. Well, she sent a picture of herself. And then she said, how about you? And it wasn't the point of that dialogue. It was the point that he was hiding these messages from me and risking everything that he had to do this. Instead of just telling me, you know, Rebecca, you make your decision. I'm going to talk to her. So, of course, he's in shock and he's trying to make excuses that he just knows aren't going to fly. And I said, I'm leaving now. I was like, I was planning on going for a three-day fast in a couple of weeks, but I'm out of here. And I packed my bags probably in like less than an hour, drove to Missouri and started my three-day fast. And I was not crying or grieving. You know, I was at the point where I was like, you know, this is everybody's journey. And Ryan and I connected on the same level we did before. You know, I, I wasn't falling back into, oh, Ryan's the one for me. We connected and magical things were happening and uh, we were learning new energy techniques and he helped me to release. You know, we did a three-day fast together. We did not eat for 72 hours. So if you can imagine in that energy, you know, we were, we were really working on, on quite a bit. I was very grateful for him for actually doing that with me. And what he taught me was, is when I get those hunger pains, when you get these pains where you think you need to eat, you go deep into that energy and figure out what that is. Like you pull it out, you do breath work, like Kundalini yoga, heart breath, dragon breath to, you know, get the energy circulating in your body, the life flow circulating in your body. And you're not going to be hungry anymore. You just need to know when to do this work and you need to know that it's a certain energy. And for mine, it was like, remember I had that last seven pounds, we, all that toxic male energy. This had just happened with my husband again. So I had to pull this out. I had to get rid of this energy. You know, I even said, Ryan, I'm not coming to you to tell you I'm leaving my husband and let's live happily ever after together. That is not what this trip is about. He said, yeah, I know. I agree. We did sleep in the same bed. Um, we were so used to doing that, you know, we we're just always listening to music together, talked. And I actually met his mother, which was huge because I was on the meeting people's mother's path. And I saw, you know, some of the things that he grew up with, some of her dynamics that I knew that he was trying to release. Like, for example, she would smoke inside the house while taking his daughter's door off 
while he was downstairs and the daughter couldn't have a door because I guess she talked on the cell phone too much or something. And then the cigarette smoke would just keep going into the daughter's room. It was, it was quite toxic. And I saw all of the stuff that was happening and I realized, okay, this is some of the stuff that he's been through. This also is the type of connection he's used to. This is what he was used to love being, you know, and I realized, okay, this makes sense with some of the things that him and I went through, that he's going through, and this is all this beautiful work in progress with the universal flow. I was very kind to her, hugged her. Um, we left, and after leaving her house is when the 72 hours was up completely, and we got to go eat together. But then on my way home, I stopped at a hotel, and I spent the night, and I, and I said to Sean, I said, I don't know why the universe is doing this, but... I need to know what about this woman would make you risk your marriage? And he goes, I wouldn't. I was like, no, but you did. You're deleting messages. You told me you hate liars. You lied. That's deceit. And he's like, it just wasn't that major. And I was like, everything we have been through with her. And you're just saying the same things over. And so we get to the point, you know, again, where he's like, I will never, ever, ever, ever reach out to her again. I'm not even going to respond back to this message. He goes, and I swear on everything that I love that this is true. And I knew with him swearing on everything that he loved that that was true. And I just thought, okay, for some strange reason, this whole thing had to happen with her. I went back and, you know, we ended up being together, bonding, connecting, everything kind of took off where it left. There was something that happened when I went to visit Ryan that I think is necessary for everybody to understand how genetics truly works. So what I was noticing with my children is their relationships were repeating patterns that I had in my imprints, quote unquote DNA, relationships that I had before they were even born, which remember, we're born into our ancestors' stories. So my 20-year-old had just got finished a relationship of two years that reminded me exactly of a relationship I went through when I was his age. Very, I was very compassionate, kind-hearted, would have done anything for this person. That's what I felt like, like Caden would have done. Um, she would look at him and she would say, Caden, you know you're ugly, right? And I remember that relationship I was talking about, the guy would make me cry and then say, you're so ugly when you cry. And so she would do these things that he would tell me that were very comparable to what I went through. Well, when they broke up, he was devastated. The same way I was when I broke up with this person. I was devastated. That is why I actually think I married my ex-husband because I didn't think I could be in love ever again because of this guy. And he was feeling the same way. He was like, Mom, I'm done. I mean, he was absolutely devastated over this girl. He couldn't go to school. He couldn't even be around the same friends that they had had. It was just overtaking him. So when I went to go see Ryan, I just think this is a really important healing technique. I decided to be a surrogate for for Caden. And I said, Ryan, help me to heal Caden. And... When I was being a surrogate for him, which is which basically means I was being him, and I went and did a scan on myself, and I realized I didn't have a heart. If you've ever seen that show, Once Upon a Time, where the evil witch takes these people's hearts and then she puts them in boxes, but when she talks to the hearts and tells them what they do, they she can control them. That's what it was like. It was like that something had my heart, and he had told me a few days ago when we went out to eat mom, you don't understand. When I tell you, it's like she has a part of me. She has a part of me that I can't get back. So then I felt it. I was like, okay, he's given his heart to her. He's given it to her. So I went and I reclaimed it and I put it back into my chest. And I promise you, this is the truth. Right after I did that, I got a call from my ex-husband while I'm still doing the healing. And he says, Caden just called me. He said he's having a heart attack. He thinks he might have to go to the hospital. He's at my mom's. He's like, Rebecca, 
what should I do? Do you think it's anxiety over grace? Do you think he's really going to have a heart attack? Just then Caden beeps in and I said, it's Caden. I'm going to, I got to go. And he's like, mom, mom, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. My heart hurts so bad. And I was like, because you just got it back. I was like, trust me on this. I was like, it's just coming back. You've got to accept it, accept your heart. And then I said, was there ever a time when you loved grace more than yourself? And he goes, absolutely all the time. And I said, okay, you love Caden more than you love her. You love Caden more than anybody. And I said, go into your heart and say that, say that, say that. And we worked on it and we worked on it and we worked on it and we calmed him down and we got him to a space where he fully embraced his own heart, took it back, got it back and accepted it. And do you know that very next day he let her go and to this day, he never talks about her ever again. So I just had to put that in there as, um, as a technique of healing, but also of how important it is that we shift our DNA because as I'm shifting my DNA, working on my toxic patterns, it's releasing the toxic patterns that our children are going to go through. And then they don't have to live it like we do because they're being born through our stories and then replaying them. So it's very important that you clear yourself, you know, as soon as possible. So at this point, we're going about our everyday normal lives. I'm enjoying my work and Sean's enjoying his and Willow's enjoying her life. My kids are are enjoying and living their lives as well. And we're planning our next ceremony for Sedona, Arizona, but that was in a couple months. During this time, I would keep in contact with Ryan. We were very loving and had a great friendship. And he was basically reliving an experience with his mother that he was needing to release himself from, you know, being in her basement, unable to financially get out. You know, his daughter knew he was there, his mother starting to know him, but it was getting to a point where he was staying stuck in a mothering pattern that he needed to release. And the more I would try to help him release it by telling him it's obvious that you're stuck in a mothering pattern because if you go to the stars and you were to look down, you'd be, you would see that you're stuck in your mom's basement without a car, without money, and without custody of your daughter, which says that you are stuck with your mom, which tells me that you need to work through a mothering pattern, whether that be abandonment or people providing for for you, whatever it is. And he would just get upset and say, no, everything is just wonderful. And then of course, ask me to borrow some money. So I was, seeing some things with him that I had never seen before, but I was holding a place of of non-judgment as best as I could. So the holidays go by, Christmas and Thanksgiving. I don't think too much of the holidays that much anymore because it's all about buying presents. And I find myself very resentful when I'm going to a store buying people presents just to try to prove I love them. So I try to show it in different ways. And I think that Christmas and Thanksgiving and things should be every day. I think we need to show people we love them and how much we love God, Creator, Source on an everyday basis. So it wasn't that life-changing. I mean, Willow had fun. She believes in Santa. She fell in love with her elf, you know, Sanny, the elf on the shelf. She loves him and she had so much fun with him finding him. And now it was time for our ceremonies in Sedona where you're doing two back-to-back. And of course, the same facilitators as before, my husband, Patricia, and myself. And I remember thinking, we just need a divine masculine because I like to have the even divine feminine masculine portals when it comes to facilitators. I ultimately think the the facilitators need to be couples that have harmoniously worked out their stuff so that they can open up their macabas and their and the light body activations to have a huge healing field around them. So we get to Sedona and we do the same thing. We we get some place and it actually starts snowing and we make the brew and there was different things that came to our attention and different things we put into the brew and the brew ended up being really, really powerful this time. It was much stronger than the brew at, at Shasta, which told me that there were some big energies that we were about ready to work through. And of course, the whole intent of all of the ceremonies is opening up true love, true health, true wealth, finding your heaven on earth, your inter- your internal joy. 
right before the ceremonies began, we decided to take a trip to the Grand Canyon. I'd never been there. And my husband and my daughter and I were hiking on the little trail to the Grand Canyon. And we were, I was looking at, at it and how vast and beautiful it is and thinking, wow, this could be life or death. I remember looking at it like it's a void. It could be anything that you really wanted it to be when you look at it in a certain way. And just then, my husband says, Rebecca. And I turn around and he opens up a box and he re-proposes to me. And he says, will you marry me? And he gave me another set of rings. And I said, yes. And Willow was right there the whole time we did it. And I thought, okay, that was well thought out. I did not plan it. It had been a while since I threw the rings. I kind of secretly gave up on it a little bit. He thought about this himself. He surprised me. And I remember feeling really happy. So the first day of the ceremony, everybody got there. Everything had a really good energy. We made sure to set the flow of the room, the divine masculine and feminine portals, so that everything could be in balance. You know, everybody was having a really good time. Willow had decided that she, it was very important that we open up a portal for a genie to come out. And she said to me, mommy, it's going to help you with all your aches and pains from working out so much because my muscles were hurting from running so much. And I just kind of giggled. And she said, it's going to help everybody else find love. And so she was making everybody else like run around in circles and do these things where the genie was going to come out. And then when the genie came out, she said, do you see it, mommy? Do you see it? And I didn't see it like she did, but I said, well, I can feel it. And she said, yes, she's like, the genie's here. And everybody went on to do whatever they were supposed to do during the ceremony. Remember, everything happens for a reason. So I've learned to take everything as it comes and let it flow. So we had some funny stories. There's some people crying. There's a lot of profound magical healing going on. Well, the next day, I decided to go in a salt cave and get a deep tissue massage. And I remember when I was in the salt cave, breathing the salt, and he was m massaging my tissues, thinking, oh, this must be the genie Willow was talking about, relieving my aches and pains. And I've been to many massage places, and this was small. So you take off your clothes and you put it in a locker, your pants and your shirt and your locker. You put a towel on, you go lie down. After I was done getting the massage, I couldn't find my pants anywhere. So it was taking me some time because the massage therapist and myself were the only ones in there. And he was like, I don't know what to say. I don't know where your pants are either. Sean knocks on the door and he's like, where's my wife? And I said, Sean, I can't find my pants anywhere. And then Willow started laughing and she said, the genie thinks this is funny. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I could not find my pants. And so I had to go back to the place with Sean's coat wrapped around me as like a skirt. And that was my genie story. But then when we got back, um, we had another day of ceremony left. Everything went great. And then we had another group of people coming in. The, there was a little bit more people. We needed, we needed some more help. And I felt very drawn to fly Ryan there to help. It was just and the depths of my knowing was that he was supposed to be there. And of course, I looked at Sean because I'm thinking, you know, Sean expresses himself so much more freely in ceremony without Ryan there. That's how he came out of his shell. But then I'm thinking, you know what? He needs to step in his power whether Ryan's there or not. So I made the executive decision for Ryan to come. And Sean wasn't completely happy about it at first. But he actually drove to the Phoenix airport from Sedona to pick Sean up instead of me having to do it. And then they apparently had this amazing, beautiful conversation on the way back. So then when Sean comes in, everybody's really happy to see him. He starts to do ceremony with us. Sean says to me, I actually missed Ryan. And Ryan started playing with Willow. Everything went beautiful. And I remember connecting with, with Ryan again and hugging him and saying, hey, I really, really missed you. We went out, it was the same place where the stars had realigned. 
that changed everything. And we went out, we looked at the stars again, and you know, we were doing meditation. Everything felt good. You know, I didn't feel like, oh, I have to leave Sean to go with Ryan. It wasn't like that. And then the next day during integration, everybody was saying how wonderful their ceremony was. And Sean actually asked to speak first. And he was saying how he missed Ryan and how Ryan was a catalyst to his change. And he was thankful for everybody, talking about the healing experiences that he had. And I remember just thinking, wow, this is quite magical. This was literally the definition of pure, unconditional love. By accepting true divine masculine energy in my life, as well as the true divine feminine energy in my life, I had created a container where the divine masculine was so loving without being competitive. And I felt like I was in a position to accept this love. There's always more layers. You can always go deeper which I will talk about and reveal in the next episode and the final episode of Upside Down Mirror, episode 22.